I grew up in a very normal middle class family. I went to Immaculate, a good um, Catholic upbringing. My parents were entrepreneurs, so I grew up in a very entrepreneurial family. My mother always tells me this story that when they got back from their honeymoon, my father no longer had a job. So he decided that he was going to go into his own business, representing major companies, industrial equipment and machinery. So he is involved like in the port and um, a lot of the heavy cranes that you see down at the port are something that he has been involved in, building of bridges. Very involved in the whole infrastructure, things to do with the infrastructure of Jamaica. And my mom was very much a partner in my dad's business. She was the grounding force. He was the one, the idea's person, but she kept him grounded, focused. She handled the accounts and really was very instrumental in the growth of his business. So I was always very, very motivated as a child. Um, didn't really have an idea of what I wanted to to be growing up, but I always felt that I always wanted to maintain a certain standard of living. I was always very hard working. My parents would set um, challenges for us or chores for us that were associated with earning money. Um, so, and I remember growing up as a child, my parents said to me, said to all of us actually, that if we got a certain grade, in, in school and we saved a certain amount of money, we would be able to go to Miami on holiday. And of my three, my two brothers and myself, I was the only one that, that rose to the challenge and I remember going off to Miami with my mom. I think I was probably about nine years old. My parents never went to university, so it was expected that that's what they wanted for us. When I was 16, I went off to university in Roanoke, Virginia. It was an all-girls school, 900 women. I think my parents felt coming from Immaculate and um, at a very young age of 16 being shipped off to, to university, that was the safest bet for me. I was not a particularly good student um, and I didn't get into trouble but my grades were not were not very good um, I mean I look back at my reports actually, as a matter of fact my daughter for my report cards the other day and she's like mom are you kidding me is this really how badly you did at school um, I just keep thinking that it was just much harder then so that's my excuse for for not having as, as great grades as my kids have today but it was interesting I made some really great friends um, again I, I don't think I was the top certainly not the top of my class in university uh, my major was psychology and speech therapy. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. At that time, it was, it was sort of the thing to do. Psychology was the thing to do. So that was what I did. I graduated from university and I decided that I did not want to come back to Jamaica. The problem was that I was not a US resident. So how was I going to stay and work in North America. Well, in those days, the immigration laws were not as strict as they are today. And because I worked throughout university, I mean, I got a job and I waitressed and um, I worked on campus. I had a social security number and I uh, got a job in, a, in, uh, in an insurance company, Aetna. Again, I didn't know much about, didn't know anything at all about insurance, but that's what I could find. Working with Aetna, I learned a lot. I learned about sales. Um, I learned that I had really good people skills and I actually did very, very well with them. And one of the things that I remember learning with Aetna was uh, indecision, not the wrong decision, is the prime cause of failure. And that's something that has really stuck with me throughout my life. So a lot of times people are very indecisive about things and I would like to say that you may make a decision, it may not be the right decision, but once you've made that decision, you know what direction to go in. Houston was fantastic. After two years of being there and not really being able to get my citizenship or my residency, I decided it was time to, to come back because I basically was traveling back and forth to North America as an illegal alien. And what was quite interesting too was that I actually sold insurance to the federal government. One day I was with a judge selling him some insurance and this gentleman came in that was dressed in a beautiful suit and he was handcuffed and they put him in this lockup at the, at the, um, the, the judge's chambers. So I said to the, to the judge, I mean, what's going on? Why have you locked up this man? And he goes, these bloody illegal aliens. And I went, oh. 
So at that point I thought to myself that was my signal that it was time to head home. I needed money to come home. I'd bought a car, which I still had payments on. So I went out and I found two more jobs. So I was selling insurance, I was selling china in a department store, and I was also waitressing in a little French restaurant. I really worked very, very hard for four months um, to make enough money to pay off my car and to ship whatever possessions I had back to Jamaica. I came back and I actually got involved in a company called Scott's Preserves, which was my grandmother's business. And she's actually in the history books of Jamaica as starting the first preserve company in Jamaica. I'm very proud of that. Uh, something, as I say, when I read the history books in Jamaica, the, the school books that are currently being used right now, it speaks about Mama Dolly, who is my grandmother. So they manufacture jams and jellies and canned ackies and breadfruit and ship things to the UK and, and the US. Actually, my grandparents at that time had passed on. My mother was running that business, so I came back and I got involved in that from a marketing perspective. What was actually quite interesting was that I developed some of their products, like pepper jelly was one of the products that I developed. I was, at the time, 23 years old, and in retrospect, I should have patented it because pepper jelly has taken off and it's now a worldwide, a household name, not just in Jamaica, but throughout the world. I worked with Scott's Preserves for about four years and then we actually went into partnership with Pan Jam, Pan Jamaica, and um, eventually they bought out the, the brand and the company. It still exists, they still manufacture some products under the Scott's name. While working with Scott's Preserves, uh, you know, it was this was never enough money really, so I was always hustling and doing something. So I remember at one point that I went into baking, and truthfully I'm the worst baker in the world, but I figured out how to bake pies, and I did a coconut pie, a chocolate pie, and a vanilla pie. And I went to all of these restaurants and I sold them these pies. So I made, I made quite a bit of money um, selling pies, which was a good thing. And then it, that didn't last for very long. Um, I then went into selling furniture. So I would travel to the country and find these sort of estate sales where people had all this antique furniture. And my girlfriend would, um, her husband would lend us a truck and we'd go down with the truck and bring all this furniture back to Kingston and get it refinished and, and, and sell furniture. At 26 I got married and um, for the first time I've been married twice and I got pregnant uh, in the second year of my marriage, which didn't last for very long. Uh, within six months of being pregnant, I actually separated from my husband, so that was quite a, a tra traumatic experience to me. But, you know, when I look back at my life, trauma or difficult times is very, very important in building one's character. So here I found myself, six months pregnant, um, separated. So I had, obviously had my daughter, um, Sarah, who is an absolutely amazing woman today and I would never change what happened you know back then uh, so after Sarah was born I moved back in with my parents and I lived with them for three months at that point I decided well I needed to go out on my own I was now a mother and I had to be responsible and look after my child so I moved to Ocherius my brother had a sailboat company, a yacht charter company. So, not that I really wanted to be involved in the charter company, but I, I saw an opportunity to do villa rentals. Uh, an opportunity came up for a property called Laughing Waters, which was owned by the government, and it was known as a protocol house. Laughing Waters is an absolutely beautiful property. Um, it's like your own private Duns River. You have two waterfalls that converge and comes on onto this magnificent white sand beach. And Laughing Waters had been used previously for various films, like Dr. No, for example, with Ursula Andrews coming out of the water. So people knew about it, but it had just sort of disappeared. But it was derelict. And I thought to myself, you know, that maybe this was an opportunity for me to get into the villa rental business and the high-end villa rental business. During the 70s, what had happened, although we were getting a lot of those types of tourists, 
um, that stopped because of the whole political situation in Jamaica and crime, etc. So I decided that this was a challenge, so I approached the UDC and managed to get a lease on Laughing Waters. So I got a lease for five years and um, managed to borrow some money to refurbish the property. So back then, I was renting that property for 6,700 US dollars a week, which was a lot of money. I was actually quite amazed at how well um, the rentals went. Within the first three months of me marketing the property, I had 20 weeks booked for the up upcoming year. Uh, so one of the things that I did was I contacted the tourist board, I went to Jam Pro, told them about the property. I started to write to these various magazines because a lot of people were looking for places to come and do fashion shoots. Just the lighting and the whole setting at Laughing Waters was ideal for that. So I contacted through Jam Pro, through the Jamaica Tourist Board. They helped me to market Laughing Waters at that time. And then I wrote to all of the various um, magazines and you know, sending them information on the property, photographs, things like that, so that they would know about it and um, it just started to, to, to mushroom, you know? And one thing led to another, and different people started coming down, people started hearing about it, wanted to do articles on it. So that was really the articles that were published by these big magazines in British L, Vogue, Paris Vogue. You know, it was, it was quite amazing. And as a result of that, things started to, started to take off. What happened with, with Laughing Waters, so that was very, very short-lived because the government changed hands. And three weeks after the government came back into power, they, I got a notice saying that my lease was being canceled. So I went to the, to the minister and I said, you know, I have a five-year lease. I've only gone um, 15 months into this lease and I have 20 weeks booked for the upcoming season. And basically they looked at me and they said, what this government wants, this government gets. That's our show. Visit our website at wealthmagja.com or follow us on Twitter at Wealth Magazine to post your comments and questions. Thanks for watching. As I said, we've, we've been working with in the two in the early two two thousands. Let's start again.